other day, I went out to have lunch with my old buddy Ray at Tri-County Motors. He and a young technician named Sam got involved in a discussion, and the old pro Ray gave him a little lesson that really opened Sam's eyes. I thought that a replay of that lunchtime seminar would make a good master tech session for this month. Basically, this month's session will deal with service situations that can lead to comebacks or repeat themselves prematurely if not properly diagnosed. Most causes for a given condition are listed in the service manual. However, for routine service jobs such as wheel alignment, overheating conditions, and brake lining or pad replacement, the service manual is too often not consulted because the job is considered just that, routine. Using the service manual is important, but more important is for you technicians to think beyond the job at hand and consider all possible causes of the condition and repair them. If you do, you will virtually eliminate comebacks and premature repeat conditions, except those caused by owner neglect or abuse. We'll even touch lightly on that subject this month, too. Here's how the whole thing happened at Tri-County Motors that day. Hi, Sam. Want to join us for lunch? Thanks, Ray. I need a break. I replaced a chattering clutch a couple of months ago, and I've got one irate customer right now because it's chattering again after less than 5,000 miles. Do you have any idea what might be causing it? Sure. A bad rear main bearing seal that's throwing oil on the disc will make it slip and eventually chatter. Another thing that I always check for is a loose or broken motor mount. Motor mounts? Hmm. I never thought about them. Well, Sam, all you had to do was check the service manual. Your mistake was that you assumed the clutch had just worn out and that all you had to do was replace it. A lot of parts do wear out. But when you run across a case of premature wear, look for another condition causing it. Clutch chatter will also develop after very little mileage if the clutch housing is not aligned properly. A sure sign of housing misalignment is a pilot bushing that shows irregular wear. The clutch housing should be aligned at reassembly whenever an engine block or clutch housing is replaced for any reason. You see, I've learned through the years not to take any job for granted and treat it as a routine repair or replace. One thing I can't afford is comebacks. And as long as I find the cause of the condition, tell the owner and correct it at the same time, I won't have any comebacks or complaints. Blaming any service condition on the driver can be a pretty touchy situation, Sam, but if you can handle it diplomatically, Leave him with a little reminder that keeping the clutch pedal free play adjusted properly can prolong the life of the clutch. So much for the clutch. Universal joints should last the life of the car. The most common cause of universal joint noise and failure is improper prop shaft angularity. The service manual has a very thorough procedure for checking prop shaft angularity, but don't stop there. Improper prop shaft angularity is almost always caused by another condition that must also be corrected. Rear springs that are sagging, broken, or have shifted off center because of broken center bolts should be replaced or repaired before aligning the prop shaft. On high performance models, look for spring windup caused by full bore acceleration. Take a close look at the rear end sheet metal for signs of collision repair. Chances are that there was structural damage that was not corrected. This can cause prop shaft misalignment. There may also be a broken shock mounting that was never repaired. Speaking of shocks, worn out shocks will allow excessive rear axle travel over bumps and chuck holes. The constant severe angles that the universal joints are subjected to under these conditions can cause failure. So always check the shocks when doing a universal joint job. If the car has a trailer hitch, look for evidence of overloading that can also cause prop shaft problems. Good point, Tech. A trailer hitch can be the source of so many problems that rather than repeat myself, I'll cover those conditions later on all at one time. Let's reverse the situation. Can bad universal joints cause anything? 
Like noisy rear axle gears? No, Sam. But as long as you brought up rear axles, I'll give you a few tips on that particular item. First of all, never replace a set of noisy gears without first running a tooth contact pattern. On a low mileage car, you may be able to correct the condition by adjusting the depth of the pinion gear. If you have to replace a gear set, always run the contact pattern to make sure you have the proper pinion depth. Another thing that should be done when you adjust or replace noisy gears is to check the case runout and axle shaft end play. Excess case runout will almost always mean a comeback in a very short time. You'll need a dial indicator to check the runout, and the service manual gives the complete procedure for each axle size. Anytime you have to replace a rear axle pinion oil seal, check the condition of the surface of the pinion flange where it contacts the oil seal. If this surface is rough or grooved, it can ruin the sealing lip of the seal. So install a new flange, even if the groove is smooth. If more than one of the seals in the rear axle assembly are leaking, chances are the seals are not at fault. If the oil level is too high or the vent is plugged, the excess oil will be forced past the seals. So check the vent and oil level before replacing any seals. Unplugging the vent and draining the excess oil may solve the problem. Right, Tech. Fluid level is also very important in automatic transmissions. When a customer comes in and complains of delayed engagement and slipping on upshifts, don't think that a band adjustment is the only answer. Oftentimes, low fluid level is the real culprit. So always check the fluid level before making unnecessary adjustments. Low fluid level lets the oil pump take in air with the fluid. Air bubbles make the fluid spongy and compressible, and pressure builds up slowly in the clutches and servos. In addition to poor operation, you can also get disturbing noises from the pump and governor. On the other hand, a high fluid level can work up foam and also cause slipping conditions. It also causes overheating, which in combination with foam can form varnish and make valves stick. A light coating of varnish may only require a fluid and filter change. A heavy coating of varnish calls for a complete teardown and clean-out. If the transmission fluid appears to have a milky look, it may indicate coolant leakage at the oil cooler unit in the radiator. Water mixed with transmission fluid swells transmission seals and softens friction material. The transmission will need a complete clean-out and reconditioning after any cooling system leaks are fixed. Another thing that should be closely checked is the throttle and transmission shift linkage. Even in the extreme case of a burned out transmission that has to be completely overhauled. Faulty linkage adjustment may be what started the breakdown on its way. And if it isn't corrected, the overhauled transmission will go just as fast. I won't deny that band adjustment or overhaul will take care of most torque flight problems, but remember... I'll finish this sentence for you. If the cause of the condition is not corrected at the same time, the condition will repeat itself prematurely. But how about the owner who causes them by neglecting to have regular routine maintenance service? If you come into contact with a customer, do a little educating. Explain what caused his problem and remind him that the chances of recurrence are pretty good if he fails to hold up his end by keeping things in good shape. If you can't tell the owner yourself, the service manager or write-up man should be clued in and take the responsibility. I agree, Tech. I'd be willing to bet that most of the comebacks that technicians get are related to work done under the hood. Generally, they involve tune-up, electrical, carburetor, and cooling system work. Let's talk about spark plugs. Whenever I do a tune-up, the first thing I do is take a close look at the plugs. The condition and color of a plug can tip you off to another condition that needs correcting if the tune-up is to last a reasonable length of time. A plug that is covered with fuel carbon has a dry black appearance. This condition can be caused by a faulty choke, clogged air cleaner, over-rich fuel mixture, improper idle mixture, or a dirty carburetor. Wet fouling is caused by a plug being saturated with oil. This is usually caused by worn rings, faulty valve stem oil seals, or worn valve guides. Overheating in plugs is indicated by a white or light gray insulator that appears to be blistered. First, make sure that the proper heat range is being used. 
Also, make sure that the cause is not over-advanced ignition timing. Last, check the owner about his driving habits. If he does a lot of high-speed highway driving or trailer towing, the answer may be a cooler plug. Before you can hear the rest of Ray's lunchtime lesson, someone will please have to turn the record to the other side. How about some hints on what to look for when you're pretty sure it's the carburetor that's a problem? Well, obviously, you'd check to make sure that it isn't incorrect timing that's causing poor performance before assuming it's the carburetor. If the ignition system checks out okay, don't be anxious to tear the carburetor apart. A great majority of all carburetor problems are caused by dirty sticking external linkage and incorrect external adjustments. Keeping the external linkage clean and properly adjusted is most important to good performance. Too many technicians jump the gun on carburetors and want to rebuild them. Save your time and the customer's money. If the car is running at all, it's a pretty good bet that the problem is not inside the carburetor. About the only internal adjustment you might check is the float level. Right, Tech. The next thing to check is to make sure that the fuel system is free of any type of contamination. Water and sediment are the two most common. Also make sure that the owner is using fuel with the correct octane rating. Small air leaks can also act just like carburetor trouble. So check all vacuum hoses to the distributor and the carburetor to make sure they are securely on the fitting and in good condition. Also check the carburetor mounting nuts and the manifold cap bolts to make sure they are tight and correctly torqued. Over torquing can also cause problems. Over tightening the air cleaner on the one and a half inch BBD will warp the air horn and cause an air leak between the fuel bowl and Venturi section. To correct this condition, install Chrysler Service Parts Package Number 3579031. A service bulletin has been issued and should be consulted for repair procedure. There are a couple of things that are rather remote from the carburetor that can affect its performance and should be checked. A sticking manifold heat control valve can cause poor acceleration performance and choke operation. Low fuel pump pressure can cause poor acceleration and top end performance. And excess pump pressure can cause rough idle from an over rich mixture. And don't overlook the possibility of incorrect valve lash causing poor idling. Hey, speaking of valves, I heard that the no-lead gasolines can raise cane with the valves. Uh, what's the scoop on that? A condition that is referred to as valve seat recession will develop in an engine that is operated on clear gasoline having no lead or other lubricating additives. What happens is that the valve seat becomes very badly worn. When leaded fuel is burned in the combustion chamber, the lead additives form new compounds which have good lubricating qualities. These compounds coat the exhaust valves and valve seats with a light film, which eliminates excessive wear of these parts. Some low lead gasolines with as little as a half gram of lead or seven hundredths phosphorus per gallon will provide enough lubrication to prevent excessive exhaust valve seat wear. However, most low pollutant fuels on the market are only about 91 octane. Even engines rated for regular grade gas may not run too well on some low lead fuels. So if you have a complaint of chronic spark knock and everything is okay in the fuel and ignition system, it may be wise to find out if the owner is using a low lead or low octane fuel that can't handle the job and advise them accordingly. Of course, low lead fuels should never be used in engines designed for premium fuel. Another item that can affect the performance of the engine is the PCV valve. If it becomes inoperative, the crankcase fumes are forced back through the crankcase air cleaner and into the carburetor. This results in poor fuel economy, and because the PCV valve is so closely tied into the emission control system, also causes poor idling. The PCV valve should be inspected every six months and replaced once a year under normal service. Frequent short trips or excessive idling would mean more frequent replacement. Let's move on to the cooling system and overheating problems. The most common mistake that is made is the assumption that the thermostat is at fault. Actually, a failed thermostat will usually stick open and seldom cause overheating. So start looking for another reason. Aside from poor circulation or leakage directly connected to the cooling system, 
These are common causes that may be overlooked. Make sure the ignition timing is correct. Check the temperature operated vacuum bypass valve, the radiator pressure cap and gasket, and don't overlook the pressure cap seat. In the same area, if the water pump bearing fails prematurely, it could mean a comeback unless you make sure it wasn't caused by over-tightened fan belts or a fan that is loose, bent, or unbalanced. A water pump bearing will not last under these conditions. If a customer complains of frequent or premature drive belt replacement, check to make sure that the pulleys have not been damaged and that they are in proper alignment. It's also important to keep the belts in proper tension adjustment by using either of the methods outlined in the service manual. A very common condition in colder climates is a dead battery, or what appears to be a dead battery. A battery charge or new battery won't always solve the problem. Always test the battery and always check the cables for looseness and corrosion. If the engine will not turn at all and only a click is heard, it's a good idea to make a detailed circuit check to determine that the problem is not in the ignition switch, the starter relay, or the starter safety switch on the transmission. Check your service manual for detailed instructions. I know that circuit checks aren't the easiest thing in the world, but if you ever find a blown fuse, find what caused it to blow. Replacing the fuse may fix it temporarily, but a bare wire or short that only grounds on bumpy roads is a sure comeback in the near future. I don't know how often you tangle with air conditioning service, Sam, but if you get a car in with low refrigerant, start looking for a leak. Refrigerant just isn't used up during normal service. Use tool C3569A, commonly called a sniffer, and your service manual to test the system for leaks. So much for under the hood. You know, wheel alignment is one condition that will need service regularly. However, certain things can cause premature misalignment. Actually, these items that I'm going to cover should be checked any time a front end is aligned. Check the height of the suspension and adjust the torsion bars if required. Check the condition of the shock absorbers and make sure the front wheels and tires are properly balanced. Also, make sure the tires are the same size and type and are properly inflated. Check the rear suspension for weak or broken springs or shifted springs caused by broken center bolts. Check the shocks for excessive leaking or broken mountings and make sure the tire sizes in the rear are the same as the front. Also check for evidence of structural damage caused by collision that may indicate body misalignment. Remember one thing, Sam. If the front suspension height needs adjusting, it should be done before the front end is aligned. And another thing, always re-aim the headlights after you adjust the front suspension height. From what I can see, when a car needs headlight aiming, I better check the same conditions that should be checked for front end alignment. You're learning quick, Sam. Just remember, the shocks won't make the cars sag if they're shot. A final note about headlights. They do burn out. However, if you get a case of headlight flaring or a complaint of frequent headlight burnout, Check the charging rate in the ground circuit. Find the cause and fix it. Otherwise, the owner's temper will get short and he'll blow his cool along with the headlights. Before we get back to work, I'd like to cover one more item, brakes. Premature brake lining replacement can result from something mechanical like dragging brakes. In this case, make sure the parking brake cable is releasing and the automatic adjusters are not over adjusting. It can also have a human cause. Like the driver, resting the foot on the brake pedal is a quick way to wear out the linings. Spotted brake drums are a sure sign of excessive hard braking. Remember, if you say anything to the owner, make sure you're wearing your diplomatic hat. Well, back to work. Hey, how about conditions that are caused by pulling a trailer? You think about it, Sam. And when we take a coffee break later, I want to see how many conditions you figure could be caused by a trailer hitch that is being used improperly. You might be surprised. You fellas are going to have to read your reference book to find out what problems a trailer hitch can cause if the car is not equipped with a trailer towing package or if it is used improperly. You might be surprised to find it can cause problems in front end alignment, overheating, and brake lining wear. 
You'll also be surprised at how comebacks and premature repeat conditions will be eliminated if you remember one thing. Think beyond the service job at hand and check all possible causes of the condition and repair them at the same time. Before I go, I'll throw in my usual reminder that the reference book should be read thoroughly. By now, you should be well aware that it contains additional subject matter that we didn't cover in the film. See you all next month.